Ains at Level 1. Chapter 1. Written by Dark Paladin 000. It was the eve of the shutdown of the DMMORPG Yggdrasil. None of Mamunga's remaining friends had bothered to show up save for Hero Hero. So yeah, sorry to bother you with all of this, Hero Hero said as he finished ranting about his job. But I do have work to get to in the morning. Who knows, maybe we'll meet again someday? Yeah, no problem, Mamunga said. Oh before I forget, did you hear about this cool new item they came up with? Hero Hero asked. A. Eh? New item? Mamunga asked. Well, it's nothing special or anything, Hero Hero said. But you know how the dive gear has information on your height, body weight, etc. Right? Well, they decided to release an item that lets you look like your real life self. They're giving them out like candy on Alfheim. If you want to use one, here it is. Hero Hero transferred an item to Mamunga. It was apparent why Mamunga had never heard of this item it was not really something that he would have normally cared for. It was just a cosmetic item, and to top it off it only worked on a player whose race was human. Even if he had known about it he would not have made the trip to Alfheim to get it. Well, thank you, Mamunga said nonetheless. It was a gift from a friend, after all. And with that, Hero Hero logged out. Ten seconds later, a bony fist hit the table. Goddamn them. Was that it? Was no one else going to bother to come? He had sent messages out to two other people, and he would have liked for Hero Hero to stay. But after his brief flash of anger all that remained was exhaustion. This was a game after all. This was all it was. A game. Not real life. All of this was going to stop existing the moment that the servers went down. Everything they had ever done was about to be erased. All the items they spent countless hours grinding over would be gone within the blink of an eye, and Mamunga would have nothing to show for it. Then again, wasn't real life just the same? Whatever you had and worked for, you would have only for a hundred years maybe at most before the final curtain fell. A certain buzzing told him that he had received a message. Oh, this was from the game developers themselves. Greetings players. The game Yggdrasil is soon going to come to a close. We thank you all for your support over these long years. Given the state of the game, we have decided to remove restrictions on certain areas and items for the last few moments. These include removing the profanity filter, sexually explicit dialogue is still not allowed however, and giving more freedom to guilds. Guild NPCs can be taken outside of their guild bases now. We will be hosting a fireworks show across all nine worlds ten minutes to midnight. A further list of changes we have implemented is attached to this message. Regards. The game developers. Fuck, Mamunga said. The devs might as well have taken a picture of themselves flipping the bird and mailed it to everyone, and he would have probably found that to be far less offensive than this message. A normal person would have construed this sort of message as a nice, warm, farewell from the game developers. For someone like Mamunga however, who took the game far too seriously, the flippant changes to rules really pissed him off. The fact that NPCs could only be used defensively was a core tactic of the game, and changing it would alter the meta in a big way. It was another reminder that nothing that happened now mattered. He started laughing to himself. Well, if nothing mattered, then maybe he should have a little fun? He could not use the item Hero Hero gave him without transforming into a human, and he wasn't going to ruin this character of his, so that just meant he would make a new character. He logged out and then made a new account. If you paid the subscription fee to Yggdrasil, you were able to open up to three accounts simultaneously without having to spend any more money. Many players made alt accounts where they would experiment with different builds and some even used this feature in order to join multiple guilds. Ain's old gown however, was one of the guild that required members to be exclusive to the guild. If someone violated this rule, they would be kicked out. Many top guilds had this rule so that the danger of espionage could be avoided. Whatever. Mamunga was the guild leader, and there was no one to stop him now. 
As a matter of face, he felt like there was no one who had the right to stop him. If they weren't here, they had no right to speak up. Now, he was unsure of what to name his character. He could call it Mamunga 2.0, but that seemed a bit too unoriginal for his tastes. He just went with calling it Suzuki Sotoru, and left it at that. Making an online character with the same name as your real name was a dumb move even in the future, but at the moment, he really couldn't care less. That username would soon be gone, after all. The instant he spawned he sent a request to the Guild of Ain's old gown to become a member. He then logged off, and logged back in as Mamunga, and accepted the request. A human character becoming a member of the Guild Ain's old gown was blasphemy, but as he had realized earlier, all of it was not going to matter regardless. He then logged into his other character. Now that he had a guild, his spawn point had been set to inside the great tomb of Nazarick. He sauntered up to the throne room and sat down on the throne of kings. He turned his head to see the guardian overseer, Albedo. It was then he noticed that she was equipped with Janungagap, meaning that Prankster Tabula had left it to his NPC. This was definitely something that would not be allowed, but again, none of it mattered anymore. Out of curiosity, Suzuki decided to go through the flavor text Tabula had written for Albedo. Incidentally, she is also a slut. Wait, what? Suzuki exclaimed. He wanted to change the text, but he didn't have the tools to do so anymore. He logged back in as Mamunga. It was a small thing to switch accounts for, but the thing was that he had also forgotten to do some other things he needed to do first. He deleted the last line in Albedo's character description, but felt he should also add something. She is in love with Suzuki Sotoru, is what he settled on. It was pretty cringe, but he had other things to do. He transferred a ring of Ain's old gown, the mirror hero hero gave him, and some fireworks to his other account and logged off. Now that he was back as Suzuki Sotoru, he used the mirror and saw that a message popped up from his dive gear. The application Idrasil wishes for permission to access your camera. Allow? Suzuki replied yes, to the question and saw that his avatar was transformed into a mirror image of his human body in the real world. The only things missing were very small details, like a small scar he had over his right knee. Otherwise though, the resemblance to his real world self was kind of freaky. And now, time to go outside. However, he was still only level 1. But then he remembered how he could take NPCs with him outside of the tomb. He put his guild ring on and grabbed onto Albedo and teleported to the entrance of Nazarick. Follow me, he said to the NPC who followed him outside the confines of the tomb and to the swampland in front of it. Petty monsters would be a problem for him, but he knew they would be nothing before a level 100 NPC. The fireworks had already started and as he looked at the corner of his screen he saw that it was 11 hours 59 minutes and 48 seconds. Oh well, looks like repeatedly logging off and logging in took up quite a bit of time. He wouldn't be able to do anything he wanted to do at this rate. And just as he thought that and the clock ran past midnight, everything changed. What? Suzuki blinked his eyes. The dark scenery around him had been replaced by a forest with sunlight streaming through the canopy even though it had been midnight just a few seconds earlier. He couldn't see any of the text or options he could normally see on his screen. He went to call up a menu, only for nothing to happen. He tried doing it using his other hand maybe the controls had been inverted or something. Still nothing. GM call. That function always got a response in Idrasil, no matter where you were. It was actually illegal for the company to not respond if a player made that comment. It was a failsafe to prevent someone from, say, suffering permanent mental damage after they had accidentally glitched into something weird in the game and needed to get out. And yet, there was no response. That began to make Suzuki panic and he collapsed to all fours. The fact that his surroundings looked very real made things worse. He was suffering from something known in the future colloquially as the sword art online effect, namely, a sensation of deep sickness when virtual reality elements were too close to reality. 
It was a reason many players did not set their avatars to look like themselves too much, and also probably why the devs had only released the item recently, when the game was being shut down anyway. The texture of the soil his hands were up against felt just like how they did in the real world. In Idrasil, touch was limited not because of technology, but for the same reason so that it wasn't too close to real life. Suzuki-sama, a voice called out to him. It called out to him again. He turned his head to see that Albedo was standing next to him, and her mouth moved. Had she just talked? That wasn't possible. She then bent over so that she was just a few inches from Suzuki. Her expression had changed another thing that was impossible in Yggdrasil, but the expression itself was warm and showed concern. Suzuki-sama, are you feeling unwell? The scent of her perfume washed over him. No, no, I'm fine, Suzuki said and then got up. He could still feel small particles of dirt on his hands. Smell, a sensation that was non-existent in the world of dive games. Where was he? The only thing he could think was that this was some sort of prank on the part of the devs, but the thing was that if that were true, it would completely illegal. So it was unlikely unless some other person managed to take over the servers somehow? It still would not add functions like smell to his dive gear, however. Are you really alright, Suzuki-sama? Albedo asked and pressed her hands against her chest. Needless to say, as Suzuki's eyes went there he started to feel some heat go towards his lower regions. And it was then that he realized that he was most definitely not in Kansas anymore. Because while he could sort of think of some far-fetched explanation for everything else that had happened, there was no way that he should actually be able to feel his private organs. Yes, yes I am, he said quickly. He looked around and took a few deep breaths. Can you teleport us back to the entrance of the great tomb of Nazarick? Indeed, it will be as you command, Albedo said. She took out a scroll she had been equipped with. A moment later, she seemed crestfallen. A thousand apologies, Suzuki-sama, but there is no way for us to teleport back to Nazarick. I cannot teleport to any location outside of my eyesight, unfortunately. EA? Suzuki said. He thought he would be safer in the guild base at least, and maybe would be able to access the GM call from there. Can you use message to contact anyone? Albedo complied with this too, but she was once again unsuccessful. She looked deeply remorseful as she conveyed this failure to Suzuki. Arg, he said as he clutched his head. This was all giving him a big headache. He was not at all ready to handle something like this. So, Suzuki-sama, Albedo said, snapping him out of his reverie. She bit one of her gloved fingers shyly. Is there anything else you would ask of me? She then approached him again so that she was just a few inches away from his face. It was as if she was inviting him to touch her, or kiss her, or to. Uh, is this really all right? Suzuki blurted out, trying to snap himself out of that train of thought. His face was turning bright red. Of course it is. Between two lovers, what could possibly be more natural? She said. And it was then that it hit Suzuki. In his endless stupidity before the game had ended, he had changed her character description. And now, she was acting it out. El love? We've just met, haven't we? Suzuki said. You can love someone you've just met. Albedo said. Isn't that how fairy tales start out? Her wings twitched in anticipation. A part of Suzuki wanted to take her up on this offer, but the thing was that he knew there was definitely something wrong going on. He kept expecting a camera crew to suddenly appear out of the bushes and tell him that it was all a joke. Albedo, there are other things which we have to deal with, Suzuki said. I am currently only level 1 and have just a single level in Mage. If we are attacked, I would be a sitting duck. Perhaps he shouldn't have said this to Albedo, given that it was possible she might attack him, but he had no other options at the moment and he hoped that the NPC's loyalties carried over to this weird place. If it didn't, well then, he would almost certainly be killed anyway without her protecting him. In response to this, Albedo withdrew and her eyes widened. 
Suzuki was captivated by how fluid her expressions were. Albedo then went ahead and embraced him. Oh, Suzuki-sama. Don't worry. I'll stand between you and any potential threat like an impenetrable wall of stone. Her grip was so strong that she unintentionally pulled Suzuki down, rubbing his face against her chest. Ah. Albedo. The first thing that we need to do is find some shelter. Suzuki said. That was what people lost in the woods did, right? And if possible, any signs of intelligent life. Understood, my lord. Albedo said. Let us go. With her hand, she summoned her war bicorn lord. Suzuki knew she had that ability, but it was still shocking to see the creature appear out of a circle on the ground rather than falling down from the sky as it worked in Yggdrasil. The beast looked as lifelike as Albedo herself. Give me your hand, Suzuki-sama, Albedo said as she got onto the beast. Suzuki was kind of wary about mounting the beast, especially as it began to snort and shake its head the moment that Albedo put her shapely rear on it. What's happening? Albedo said, confused. Once she got off, the beast calmed down. Sit down. As per her order, the bicorn sat down on its knees, so it was clearly obeying her like a normal summon would. However, when she tried to ride it again it refused, no matter what she told it. Wait, Albedo, Suzuki said, remembering a bit of Yggdrasil lore. Bicorns are the opposite of unicorns in other words, if you're a virgin, you won't be able to ride it. Oh, Albedo said, now crestfallen. This lasted for an instant as she then gave Suzuki a predatory look. Suzuki felt the hairs on his neck stand up. Is this how deer felt when they were confronted face to face with lions? Then there's only one thing to do then. Wait, Albedo, I can't ride that even if you can, Suzuki said. So for now, you need to get yourself for another mount. Albedo once again looked crestfallen and pouted as she dismissed her summon. In such a case, Suzuki-sama, the best thing for me to do would be to carry you in my arms. My armor is enchanted to let me fly, and my gear is also suited to give me flight. If we fly high up, we will be able to survey the land with ease. That did seem like a good idea to Suzuki. Or, he could use one of his ow and then it hit him again that he didn't have his gear as Mamunga. He had stored so much junk over the years that he would most definitely have something for this occasion. Too bad he had decided to change accounts and so he had nothing on him now. No, that wasn't true. New players did get a few things upon joining. As he saw Albedo take out her halberd from what seemed like thin air, it occurred to him that perhaps he could access his own inventory. As he thought of it, everything in his inventory immediately came to mind. He had the fireworks he had transferred over, as well as a blank journal and ten gold pieces. He took out one of the coins and examined it. It was of the type that were designed after the Valkyrie's downfall patch. As for offensive abilities, the only spell he had chosen to learn while creating his character and putting a level in Mage was Magic Arrow, which was especially useless given he was only level 1 right now. As it stood, he had a grand total of two mana points and could cast it twice. He didn't know how he knew that he only had two mana points, he just somehow could look within himself and tell. All right, let's get going then, Suzuki said. Albedo had put on her armor and she extended her arms. Feeling rather foolish, Suzuki let Albedo pick him up and she then skyrocketed upwards. Her speed was nothing incredible by her standards but Suzuki felt like his skin was almost going to leave his body behind. Before he could tell her to slow down, she had already begun her descent. Over there, Suzuki-sama, I think that's a village, she said. Suzuki strained his eyes and saw something that looked like a bunch of huts, though at this distance he couldn't really be sure. Okay, let's go in that direction, but a bit slower this time, okay? Albedo complied, and her speed was far more comfortable for Suzuki now, even though she was still so fast that Suzuki felt like he was on a motorbike. The village was just a collection of mud huts, and Suzuki didn't recall any such area within Yggdrasil, though that could have just been because he had never been here before. 
a good portion of Yggdrasil had been undiscovered, after all. Their landing had not gone unnoticed, however, as a nearby girl screamed and fell over. Sorry. Suzuki said as he got out of Albedo's arms. We didn't mean to startle you. The girl, who had light blonde hair and was wearing a plain red dress, eyed the two of them nervously. In particular, she seemed to be very wary of Albedo. If you don't mind me asking something, are you an NPC or a player? Suzuki asked the girl. H huh, the girl asked, as if she didn't know what he had said. Could she not speak Japanese? Do you understand me? Suzuki asked very slowly while enunciating each syllable. At that moment, Ablado chose to walk over to the girl and then grab her by the neck lifting her several feet above the ground. Suzuki-sama has asked you a question, worm, and it would be prudent of you to answer. Put her down, Albedo. Suzuki shouted. Albedo complied and the girl fell onto her bottom. Her eyes were clearly holding back tears. I'm sorry about that, Suzuki said. My partner here just got a little bit too excited. What's your name? E. Henry, the girl managed to say. So she did speak Japanese. Ah, my name is Suzuki, and this is Albedo, Suzuki said. The names didn't seem to mean anything to the girl. Suzuki offered his hand to help her up, which she hesitantly took. Surprisingly, she seemed very strong, at least to Suzuki. Like I was asking you earlier, are you a player? Or an NPC? I don't really get the question, she answered after a brief pause. Ah. So she was definitely some sort of NPC then if she didn't understand the question either that, or Yggdrasil had manifested into some other strange physical world. Which he was willing to believe, but he wanted to check a few more things out first. My partner and I got lost in the woods, and we just managed to find our way out, and we were wondering where we were. You came from the forest of Tob, the girl asked incredulously. From the way she phrased the question, it was clear that the forest was apparently a very dangerous place. Ah yes, Suzuki said. At the moment, they were interrupted by a man with brown hair running towards them. Henry? Are you all right? Your sister heard you screaming. He paused as he sized up Suzuki first. Suzuki was wearing his newbie gear from Idrasil, which was a simple brown robe with no enchantments, but the moment the man saw Albedo he took a step back. No doubt she was the far more stunning and threatening specimen between them. Ah, uh, pa? Henry said to the man. These two say they came from the forest of Tob after they got lost. They landed a bit suddenly so I screamed because I was surprised, that's all. Suzuki was very happy that she didn't mention the incident where Albedo had nearly choked her. Indeed, Suzuki said to the man who was clearly this girl's father. We were exploring the forest of Tob but got lost, thankfully, we found our way back here. We would appreciate some help, such as further directions to where else we could go, and any other supplies if you have them. He then reached behind his back so it would not look like he had taken a gold coin out of thin air as he reached for his inventory. He had only ten of them the ten new players were given before they logged in, and hoped that it would be enough for now. Of course, you will be well compensated for your troubles. Suzuki handed the coin to the man who examined it with a keen eye. Is this gold plated? No, solid gold, Suzuki said. At least, it was so in Yggdrasil. The man eyed the two of them once again. He seemed even more wary of them. Just where are you from originally, if you don't mind me asking? You're not from the Empire, are you? We're from a region far over there, Suzuki said as he pointed in a random direction behind them. Come on Papa, they look like they could use our help, Henry pleaded with her father, whose eyes softened. Well, if my girl here thinks you're okay, you're okay in my books too then, he said. He handed Suzuki back the gold coin. No need for that, I'm always happy to help a fellow friend in need, and besides, if I went around with a gold piece people would think I stole it or something. Thank you, Suzuki said. My name is Suzuki Sotoru, and this here is Albedo. Please, come inside then, 
he said. My name's Daniel, but you can call me Dan like everyone else does. Indeed, just a moment please, Suzuki said. He then took Albedo aside and told her to not attack anyone so quickly like she had earlier. Albedo agreed, but she seemed to be preoccupied with some other thought. Suzuki-sama called me his partner, she muttered under her breath. The inside of the house was nothing magnificent. It was actually quite plain and seemed to represent the lowest form of poverty to someone like Suzuki. Even his old apartment was both larger and cleaner than this place. There was nothing in the form of technology save for a wooden stove where a woman was cooking, who was probably Dan's wife. A little girl was standing beside her, who ran up to meet Henry. Nemu, look! We have visitors. This is Suzuki and Albedo. She said and motioned to the two of them. Nemu was wary of even Suzuki, and completely drew back upon seeing Albedo. Their mother also shot the two of them an apprehensive look before going back to what she was doing. So, please sit down, Dan said. There were only two chairs, and Dan insisted that the two of them take them. So, we don't have much, but anyway, I guess the two of you are thirsty after being in the forest for so long. Henry, fetch our guests two glasses of water. Henry came back with two porcelain cups filled with clear water. Suzuki was not thirsty yet, but he supposed there was little harm in trying some. He took a tentative sip and immediately knew that he was not in some sort of dive gear related simulation. Nothing could mimic taste. So this was some sort of parallel world then, for sure. Albedo did not drink at all. So, if you don't mind me asking, where are we exactly right now? Suzuki asked. You're in the village of Khan, Dan said. Sadly I've never heard of it, Suzuki said. Not many people have, but we are close to Irantel, so I think that's direction enough. I could point you the way to the city if you want, Dan said. That would be splendid, Suzuki said. And we couldn't be more grateful for that kind of help. It seemed Irantel was a large city, but Suzuki needed some more information. If you don't mind me asking though, when I offered to pay you you looked at the coin strangely. Is a different form of currency used here? Well, people do use gold, Dan said. I just haven't seen one in my whole life is all. We use coppers and occasionally silvers around here. Ah, so they simply used smaller denominations of currency. They exchanged some more small talk until a meal had been prepared. It was a steamed stew, and once again, Albedo didn't consume any of it. She had no need to of course, but no doubt it seemed rude to the rest of the family. Henry and Nemu had run off, probably to play, Suzuki assumed, in the meantime while he had been talking to Dan, but came back for lunch. Dan's wife, Rena, seemed to be nice enough though at the same time a bit suspicious of them, which really couldn't be helped, especially given how Albedo looked. Suzuki wanted to ask about so much more than he was told, but the problem was that he had a sinking feeling that what he was asking about was common knowledge in this world and so he refrained from such. He did ask about the empire that Dan had mentioned earlier, and Dan simply replied that it was a large neighboring country which regularly attempted to invade this one. There were even rumors of armored figures attacking villages probably why they had been so apprehensive of Albedo. With that and their meal over, Suzuki asked if there was a nearby inn where they could maybe rent a room. Sadly, no, there's nothing like that, but we do have a spare room in the back I could get tidied up if you'd like to crash here for a while, Dan said. That was acceptable for Suzuki, though once again, Dan seemed to decline payment. As Henry went outside with Nemu, Suzuki followed her. Dan and Rena seemed to be busy with something, so he was able to do this stealthily enough, with Albedo trailing behind him. Hey, he called out. Henry stopped in her tracks. Yes? About what happened with he wasn't sure how to phrase it with Nemu nearby you and Albedo earlier, thanks for not bringing it up again, I mean. Henry gave him a weak smile. No problem. So, you two are going to play? Play? No, we have work to do. Henry said. The fields need to be ploughed today. 
Suzuki was led to their fields, where he saw that Henry dragged the wooden plow behind her on her own. The family didn't seem to own any animals to do such labor for them. Her father was busy somewhere else along with her mother, so this was entirely left up to her. Mind if we get you some help? Suzuki asked. Henry looked at Suzuki quizzically. Nah, I'm good. Hey, Albedo, bring out your bicorn again, Suzuki said. Albedo did so, much to the two girls' shock. Suzuki then had the plow attached to the bicorn, being careful not to touch it as it seemed that would weaken in. Needless to say, the bicorn got done in five minutes what would have probably kept Henry busy the entire afternoon. Incredible! Henry said, and both she and her sister clapped as the bicorn finished the job and Albedo cancelled the summon. Henry even gave Suzuki a small bow. Thank you so much for your help. It was no problem, and I felt like I owed you that after the events of earlier today, Suzuki said. Also, he wanted to talk to Henry alone to see if he could perhaps weasel out any further information from her. It was hard talking to the adults without arousing suspicion, but it might be easier with Henry. So, you seemed really shocked to see Albedo come out of the sky. Flying is common where I come from do people not fly here? Flying was a rather universal ability either through the third tier spell in Yggdrasil or magic item. I think I've heard stories of people flying, Henry said. But I've never seen it myself. So it wasn't too common then which meant he should avoid flying around in plain sight if possible. But you do know of magic? Yes, my friend from E. Rantel is an alchemist, Henry said. He comes to the village occasionally. She then rolled up her sleeves. Well, I should get to cleaning now. I need to get your room ready. She then ran off into the house. Suzuki was kind of perplexed he had thought that a village girl would have a bit more free time on her hands. But the only one in the family who seemed to be free was Nemu, who hesitantly walked alongside Suzuki and Albedo as they walked around the village. She didn't talk very much but did point to some things she knew. Along the way, Suzuki did cite several other villagers, but he simply explained that he was visiting Dan and his family and they all seemed to leave him alone after that. He wanted to ask a lot of them questions, but he knew a bunch of them would be suspicious, and furthermore, he couldn't be sure if they were true or not. As such, sunset came, dinner went by, and it was time to sleep. Suzuki and Albedo had been given a separate room from the others who all seemed to sleep in a single large bed. This room is filthy, Albedo said, though thankfully not too loudly. And below the status of a supreme being such as yourself. Yeah, but it's good enough for now, Suzuki said as he lied down. Based on what he had seen of Dan and his family, he was pretty sure that this was the best that they could offer him. Albedo didn't need to sleep and so stood guard over Suzuki as he slept. He strangely enough fell asleep very quickly, despite having not done anything much that day at all. At least, certainly not physically.